Hi everyone, in this video we're going to be going through non-arm's length transfers and attribution. We're going to be applying the rules from ITA 69 and 74.1 from your lectures and readings to a set of case facts. But first, let's take a quick look at a summary of non-arm's length transfers. You'll recall when we're looking at a transfer, we need to consider the transfer price, the proceeds of disposition for the transferor, and what I've got on the rightmost column there, the adjusted cost base for the transferee. If the transfer price occurs at fair market value, or FMV, everything else, the proceeds of disposition, and again, in the rightmost column, the adjusted cost base for the transferee, all of it occurs at fair market value. What we need to consider are inadequate considerations or any consideration that is different from the fair market value. For example, if the transfer price is above fair market value, the proceeds of disposition for the transferor will be the actual proceeds, whereas the adjusted cost base for the transferee are going to be the fair market value. If the transfer price occurs below fair market value, the proceeds of disposition for the transferor are the fair market value, and the adjusted cost base for the transferee are the actual proceeds. And finally, we can go well below the fair market value and actually have a zero amount for the transfer price. This is known as a gift, and that is going to be treated a little differently, where the POD for the transferor is the fair market value, and the adjusted cost base for the transferee is the fair market value. Again, this is from your readings and lecture, and I think this will make more sense if we apply it to a case. So let's take a look at some case facts. Jaden, who's 25, has 100 shares in Apple Corp. Jaden would like to transfer the shares to his sister, who's 22. Her name is Lexi. Now, because these two are related, I'll indicate that they are related by using a dotted green line between them. Jaden originally purchased the shares for $12 a share. Thus, his adjusted cost base is $12 a share. The initial transfer between Jaden and Lexi would be occurring on January 1st, when the fair market value is $15 a share. Lexi plans to sell the shares to an unrelated party on December 31st, and let's say at that time, the share value will be $20 a share. This is basically the scenario and the fact pattern we're going to use for three different scenarios. The shares being gifted upon initial transfer above and below fair market value on that initial transfer. Let's take a look. The first scenario for the transfer price will be if it's gifted. So just remember that the transfer price between the non-arm's length parties matters. And what we're referring to is how much is Lexi paying back to Jaden in return for receiving these shares of Apple. What are the tax consequences to each sibling if the shares are gifted? Which is another way of saying the transfer price is zero. Well, for Jaden, he'll have a proceeds of disposition of $1,500, which is 100 shares multiplied by $15 a share. His adjusted cost base will be $1,200, which is his $12 per share price multiplied by 100 shares. That leads to a capital gain of $300 and a taxable capital gain of $150. Lexi, on the other hand, is going to have a proceeds of disposition in December when she makes her sale of $2,000. That's $20 a share times 100 shares. Her adjusted cost base is $1,500. And this is because she received the shares without giving anything in return. It was gifted to her. So her adjusted cost base is deemed to be the fair market value at the time. $15 a share multiplied by 100 shares. All of this results in a capital gain of $500 or a taxable capital gain of $250. The next scenario will be if the shares are transferred below fair market value. So what are the tax consequences to each sibling if the shares are sold to Lexi for $10 a share? And remember, on January 1st, the fair market value is $15 a share. 
Jaden will have a proceeds of disposition of $1,500 still. In other words, he is deemed to have disposed of the shares for the fair market value, even though he actually sold them for $10 a share. His adjusted cost base remains the same, and so he still recognizes a capital gain of $300 and a taxable capital gain of $150. Lexi is going to still have a proceeds of disposition of $2,000. Remember, Lexi is selling the shares to an unrelated third party. Her adjusted cost base, however, is going to be the actual proceeds, $10 a share times 100 shares. This results in a capital gain of $1,000 and a taxable capital gain of $500. The next scenario is going to be if the transfer price is above fair market value. What are the tax consequences to each sibling if the shares are sold to Lexi for $18 a share? Jaden will see his proceeds of disposition increase. $18 a share times $100 is $1,800. His adjusted cost base hasn't changed, of course, but his capital gain will go up to $600, and his taxable capital gain is $300 now. Lexi will see her proceeds of disposition, remember, being sold to an unrelated third party in December, remains $2,000. What's interesting is her adjusted cost base is only $1,500. Just because she paid more for it, because it's a non-arm's length transaction, she doesn't get to claim a higher ACB. Her capital gain then is $500, and the taxable capital gain is $250. When we're talking about shares, the transfer price is just part of what we want to keep in mind. We know that shares can pay dividends, and that's a good time for us to talk about attribution. From your lecture notes and your readings, you were to look at 74.1, subsection 1, and subsection 2. As a quick reminder, subsection 1 deals with property transfer to a spouse or common law partner and deals with attribution in those instances, whereas subsection 2 deals with property transferred to a non-arm's length individual who is under 18 years of age. Of note, 74.1 subsection 2 will also include nieces and nephews, even though in other parts of the Income Tax Act, nieces and nephews are not considered to be related. So that's something you should pay attention to. So let's consider dividends in a scenario. I have here just part of the diagram we've been using. We can see the siblings, Jaden and Lexi, and they're still related and the intention to transfer the shares is still there. The transfer still occurs on January 1st. We see 100 shares going from Jaden to Lexi on January 1st when the fair market value is $15 a share. Let's add some information to our diagram. Let's say the shares pay an eligible dividend of $1.15 a share on June 15th, 20x9. Well, how will those dividends be included in income? Specify the amount, and to which taxpayer. It'll be as follows. First, you can think of the cash received. Cash is received by Lexi in this scenario. And Lexi is receiving $1.15 times 100 shares or $115. But that's not necessarily the amount that's included in income. Remember, eligible dividends are grossed up. So the amount included in Lexi's income would be $115 times 1.38 which gets us to $158.70. Now, 38% is the eligible dividend gross up as of the time of this recording. If you're looking at this video, I do recommend that you go back to check to see what the gross up is for the current time that you're watching the video. Now, let's keep the same basic setup here, but look at a different scenario. What if Lexi was 17 years old instead of 22 years old? Well, the cash received by Lexi is the same, right? It's still $1.15 a share times 100 shares or $115. However, this is where the attribution rule kicks in. And now this income is going to be attributed back to Jaden. So the eligible dividends are still grossed up, but the amount attributes back to Jaden. That means Jaden has an inclusion to income, and the amount would be the same, $115 times 1.38, at least as of the time of this recording, for a total of 
and 70 cents. That's all I have for you in this video. So until next time, thanks so much for watching and happy studying.